what I would say is that VHS Massacre and VHS Massacre 2, if, if I had just put them out, I don't think they would have found the right audience. Trauma in the VHS Massacre movies was the perfect overlap. Those things worked really well together. So keep that in mind too when you're picking the distribution company. The movie should line up kind of perfectly with what the distribution company is. So if it's a documentary about VHS, but it's got this B-movie exploitation edge, then Trauma makes sense, you know? If it wasn't so B movie, then that might may, may have not been the best choice. It may be better to actually go with a company that specifically distributes docs, you know. And that's the same thing we do with the film festival with this movie. Is we went after festivals that were more inclined to take B movies and stuff like that and horror. So when YouTube came out, you can have something of great value and just go to the wrong person and they don't see value in it. And when you go to the right person, then they see value in it. So. Uh, I was very lucky uh, in that way. So anyway, that is essentially how you could build a doc. You get bits of footage. For us, the main stuff was interviews, booking interviews on the weekends. Even if it's once a month and you do it over the course of the year, that's 12 interviews. And then it was getting B-roll in different video stores. Like these guys let us shoot in there. Um, and, and a lot of people will, like sometimes you can just get permission. We, in a lot of cases, we were going in the remaining mom and pop video stores and they were happy to have us there. Let's say you loved horror films or you love independent films. You can make a documentary about someone else making a horror film or something like that. There's, there's going to be something you can figure out to make a movie about. You want to make sure to do is to not have to rely on Zoom interviews for a feature length doc. It's going to really cut down on the quality of your work. It's going to cut down on the sellability. So again, if you have to do Zoom, try to get them to shoot clean with their camera or their phone on the other side and then send it to you. It's tough. Not everyone wants to do it. And to some degree, you, you take what you can get. In the first VHS mask you see, we actually have like People called in on their phones. We used all sorts of methods. In regard to a structure, one of the best things I learned from about 20 years of narrative independent filmmaking and working for places like CBS and NBC, I'm not the best at narrative and story structure. All that experience sort of beat it into me. So I think I'm decent at it now. But the key to making a documentary is storytelling. It really, in many cases, can have a similar structure to a feature length film. That's not to say you try to totally manipulate things. As much as you can, the documentary should be true. You shouldn't be fudging things and manipulating things to, to force a story. The amazing thing about documentary is it's a, it's a lot like sculpture. You can gather a hundred hours worth of material and slowly sculpt it into something um, that is more structured. For us, there were several beats in this. I mean, one of the things is Mark of the Beast came out, we were able to go to Kim's video, and then Kim's video went under, and so that was kind of uh, an arc, a sad arc. That's another thing, too, is if you shoot over the course of a couple years, things will happen. Kim's video went out of business, and we could go to that, and the, the small mom and pop of the story went out of business, and we could go to that and, and document that. So this is, uh, we interviewed Deva Reed, you know, using Zoom, you know, uh, I think we're using Zoom at the time on an iPad. And so it's not, I wouldn't do it this way in 2023, but I actually think it, it, it worked for what it was. So there are things you could do to make, uh, to make the film work. I mean, this is, this sounds kind of trite, but you do have to pick a subject matter that you're sort of obsessed with and, uh, you have feelings about because uh, you have to be motivated to push through. Um, this was a lot of fun, you know, researching the history of VHS and beta and, and all that stuff. A lot, of that, a lot of it I lived through, but it was still interesting to sort of line up the facts and find clips that made sense. The thing I also emphasized in both VHS documentaries was uh, kind of pulling the curtain back in independent film distribution. When I started making independent films in the late 90s, pretty much 99, 1999 to 2000, you could read books on film distribution, but that the business still had a sort of shroud over it. Filmmaking wasn't something that lower class and middle class kids did. It just wasn't. It was a rich person's club that we tried to sort of fight our way into. 
And uh, we did to some degree, yes, although we got screwed by most of the companies that put out our movies. We were competing against uh, giants. The late 90s and early 2000s uh, filmmaking movement was not that different from the sort of YouTubers uh, competing against uh, some of the other media conglomerates. Don't be ashamed of having to work a day job and making your movies on the side. Although I was able to make it in the corporate media world, at places like CBS and NBC and stuff like that, it's never fun, not really. Sometimes it's better to just have a job that is manageable and the stress is manageable so that you can feel like a normal person so that you can then shoot your movies on your vacation or on the weekends. Being an artist is difficult. It's always been difficult. But I think certain people are compelled to make art because it makes them feel better. It staves off anxiety. Sometimes the art they make connects with thousands or even hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Get yourself a Draycast light kit uh, with documentary. You, only, you really just need a light, a lightweight portable light kit. Draycast is good because you can change the color temperature. They have barn doors on the lights, so they're directional and they're lightweight. It's maybe $200 for a kit. I had access to a kit, so I didn't have to buy that. But if it, if that's some of the little money you have to buy is a couple hundred dollar light kit, um, you can even do it for cheaper. I mean, the, I have an LED light pointing at me right now. I think that's a $20 light. So you can do it even cheaper, but some lights are important. And try to use a decent cinema camera if you can. I recommend the Blackmagic 4K Pocket. If you can't do that, um, a Sony mirrorless or uh, Lumex mirrorless. In VHS-2, there are a few things shot on my phone. I think I was using my Pixel phone, my 4K Pixel phone. For me, it was important to have my documentary still look like cinema the most I could. So it was important to shoot at 24 frames to color grade and do all the things to make it look like a, a film as much as possible. Uh, like this is cell phone footage here, interior of a, of a store. It's not bad to have some B-roll that's phone footage in a dock if you have to. Um, if you're just grabbing shots randomly or you're in a situation where you really can't put down a tripod, that's totally acceptable nowadays. And uh, I was talking to someone who worked at CNBC, they said in news and modern doc documentary, it's acceptable to have some. The reason why the cinema, cinema camera is important is because you can capture the film with a, with a, a certain amount of contrast ratio and color space, or you could shoot flat, which allows you to really push things in post to give the film a look. If you're going to bother to shoot a film, try to shoot it with some kind of cinema camera but i you know black magic for instance you can shoot in like you can shoot in apple pro Res. so you could take that in and even in lumetri color which is part of premiere you can really color grade the thing in beautiful ways even in the in documentary you still want to be able to sort of sculpt the image you still want to be able to play with the image and color even if it's just popping the saturation or a cost a uh, adjusting the white and black levels and stuff like that. So there are certain techniques you can use for B-roll. Even this stuff, if Ken is interviewing me, like I can be walking and moving while I'm talking. I don't have to be sitting in a chair or I can be doing things. It's kind of like the old Law & Order. If you watched old Law & Order episodes, the cops would interview someone at work and they'd always be doing stuff like moving boxes and stuff like that. That still works for documentary. You don't want it to be false, but like, you know, it, if you have to interview someone, let's say they didn't eat breakfast, turn the camera on and walk with them as they go to the bagel shop and talk with them there. Get B-roll of them there, get them doing something, and they get their bagel and they eat it. And then maybe you're interviewing them in a more formal environment. But you really do need B-roll and you need people in, in sort of natural environments to build out the documentary. So a cheat is having a documentary subject which has just amazing detail. So things like VHS and DVD are wonderful because there's beautiful artwork all over the place, right? I don't want to say pick something beautiful to shoot because what you may have a drive to shoot the uglier side of something and that maybe that needs to be done.
that will draw its, its own audience movie, based upon the importance um, of the subject matter. You know, if you're very tough to get a shooting the aftermath of a hurricane or something, try to be objective and try to build the story out of the truth. Something crazy, um, something there are different schools of documentary. You can this morning, be an advocate, one of the suggestions which is a, for me basically a skewed perspective. Called, uh, You're saying, I am cat, taking a stance, I'm going this way. So you're an advocate for something. Mark. And then, that's and okay. You can do what is supposed to be objective news movies will get and you struggle and to keep your opinion in the middle. It's always a struggle and you're never perfect, the but the struggle is important. Uh, so you can try to make a documentary yeah, that yeah. way. And, it's not and then there's other types of documentary. There's something called a reflexive documentary, which this is because we're always showing... It's a documentary about making a documentary in a way. You're showing like behind the scenes and cameras and gear and stuff. And so I, I would do that. Maybe pick up a, a few books about documentary and <clears throat> research some of the types of different schools of thought and documentary. There's, there's Cinema Verte, which is essentially the fly in the wall documentary where you're just Hollywood studios. The movie industry. Let's say you're not you're not staging or interviewing anyone. You're in a room with people and you're just rolling and they are trying to do what they normally do. Uh, the problem is the presence of the camera, much like a scientific experiment, the adding the camera in changes all of the subjects because they're aware of it. And then hidden camera is not ethical. So it's very hard to get something pure. But um, eventually, if you have a camera and people are just trying to do their daily routine, uh, they will notice it less and less. That's never purely, the subject is never purely unaware of the, the ca camera, usually. You can steal shots like that, telephoto, but again, there's ethics to it. There's also illustration, uh, essentially, where you're doing elaborate reenactments that you're sort of trying, trying to, you're trying to illustrate something. So you have your entire doc planned out in a specific way, and you're creating scenes through reenactments and stuff like that. So that's a, that's a type of doc. Um, thin Blue Line, the Thin Blue Line is a good example of that. Um, so there's that's all sorts of different schools of documentary. Reenactments can be fun. That's something to look into. Um, and they can sort of be one-offs. Like, you could do that. You can do a reenactment over a, a weekend, shoot that one scene. You know. uh, so you could. With documentary, you really can sort of piecemeal it. So New York Times did positive reviews of VHS Massacre 2. Actually, they thought that one was better, but they also liked this one. And if I can do a $500 feature-length documentary, 500 for this one and 500 for VHS Massacre 2. If I can do that, then you can do that. And the, the, the second one won 23 awards. First one won five or six. It's almost 30 awards combined with the first two in positive review in New York Times. If I can do it, you can do it.